Talk Show. Recorded live. Good evening, everyone. This is Jörg Lissmann once again from YouTube channel Jogler66, together with Walt Stickel from www.granddesignexposed.com. We are doing today another broadcast on the book, The Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy. And we are dealing today with two very interesting topics that we already started last week by uh, introducing you into John Carroll. We are dealing with Charles and Daniel Carroll and the whole Carroll family and their involvement in the founding of the United States in 1776. Today we have Thursday, the 14th of May, 2015, and I over here in Europe have a Catholic holiday today that is celebrated all over. That is the so-called Ascension Day. Uh, don't ask me who ascended or whatever, because I don't care for these Roman Catholic holidays, as no real Bible-believing Christian should anyway. But I remember when there was the time and I lived in Germany, this day was called Father's Day. And all the fathers came out with their little wagons with a cradle of beer on it and drinking and running through the streets all day, drinking, eating, um, coveting, yelling. And I don't think that that is anything to celebrate anyway. <laughs> I mean, whether if you're a Christian or not, just keep it in the house, you know. But it's just like in Sodom at that time. So that's the day we have today, 14th of May 2015. And I'm very much looking forward to introduce to you once again my good friend and brother in Christ, Walt Stickel, over there on the Oregon coast and western side of the United States of America. How are you, Walt? And welcome to the broadcast. And, and thanks, uh, York. Uh, it's a pleasure, too, to have another voice, a voice from the European U Union and a representative here in the in the country of Romerica, and uh, so uh, and it's looking forward to giving us some history of of uh, the founding of this country, the three main founders, and that's where we're going to go today. Uh, is John, Charles, and Daniel, and just one little update. You know this book that we're reading. Everything that we're reading out of this book, it can, you can go up and download. I just want to remind the listeners that uh, I'm still doing some updates. I did a big update to, to it yesterday. So to, if you've uh, downloaded it earlier, you can go up and get another file to replace the old. So anyway, I'm looking forward to this uh, read. So it's back to you, York. Yeah, just a little advice. When you download the PDF from the Internet, just put a little note in there where you put the download link in, and every time when you open the PDF, just open the download link once again and see if there have been any changes so that you can update your PDF. That's a very easy way to keep a hold on that, and I just do the same thing. Uh, before we start now, you, uh, I have to mention, of course, that we are again on the call of Hour of the Truth. And I want to remind the listeners, especially our new listeners who have come to us via uh, Block Talk Radio, uh, Walt's other platform, Mystery Babylon News Radio, that we are also broadcasting these on. And that is why, again, like last week, we will put these in two parts of each 45 minutes. So we will have a little break in there of a few seconds that we can make the cut between the two parts. I want to remind all the listeners of the motto of the show of Hour of the Truth. And that motto is called that Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and sent out their crusades. Times and methods may have changed. The goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible-believing people who uphold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. That is the motto that we are working under, and we uphold both, Walt and I, and do not even discuss this possibility, the 1611 King James Version of the Bible, because we see that this is today the only uncorrupted, pure word of God preserved in the English language. And when there are any statements of the Bible following in our broadcast, they are whether from the King James Bible or when we use another Bible, because to show you the corruptness of the NIV and the NASB and the New Living Translation and 
what all these other Bibles are called, then we will explicitly tell you that this comes from one of the corrupted Bibles and not from the King James Bible. But without any further ado, I will now turn to the subject that we are announcing, uh, that we have announced. Uh, Walt said that we will deal with John, Charles, and Daniel Carroll. Well, we uh, covered already uh, John Carroll last week, so we will continue now with um, Charles Carroll, then afterwards Daniel, and then to put it all together, there's a little... <clears throat> um, there's a little part in this book, about four pages long, that deals with the whole Carroll family and their total involvement in the founding of the United States of America in 1776 to explain to everybody without any doubt that it was the plan of the Roman Catholic Church to take over that country from its inception. And the inception was not the time of the colonies. Those were Protestant. The inception of the country came in 1776 with the Declaration of, uh, how do you call that? Uh, Declaration of Independence and uh, <clears throat> with the Constitution. And then 13 years later, 1789, 13 years later, Kabbalistic number, 13 stands for revolution. Never forget that. It stands for rebellion. That's the number 13 for. 13 years later, 1789, the United States of America was a country and elected its first president, George Washington, who, according to many, is a Christian, and who, according to others, a real researchers, like I like to call them, who see through the deception, just look up in the Capitol, look at the apotheosis painting on the top of the Capitol ceiling, and see that there is a so-called Christian being deified together with a lot of pagan goddesses. Well, make up your mind or do your own study. As I always say, always do your own research. Don't believe Walt. Don't believe me. Believe the things that you've studied on your own. But we are here to put you on the way and maybe to give you a little bit the direction to what you could study. So, without any further ado, or do you have anything to say, Walt? I, then otherwise, I would start reading now. One quick comment. We are here to, to put the word Jesuits and Jesuit in your vocabulary so you understand and can comprehend what a Jesuit is. And secondly, I would like to add to that, we are also here to tell you that it is called Protestant and want to tell you what the Protestants of today don't do. Namely, they do not protest anymore. And what should they protest? Well, that's already part of this series that it has been done in the, in the past with all the episodes that we had had. And it also will be dealt with in the future, what you should really protest. Because it is a protestant, not a protestant. I mean, it's a little bit the emphasis of how you speak it out to even understand what it is. But okay, I'm going to start now with um, a part that is taken out of the book, The Grand Design Exposed, from author John Daniel, chapter 16, The Birth of America Orchestrated and Celebrated by Church of Rome. And we are dealing now with Charles Carroll, also called the Flaming Patriot. Charles Carroll was born in September 19, 1737, and died in the age of 95 on November 14, 1832. John Carroll's Jesuit education had prepared him for the work of expanding the triumphal Roman Catholic spiritual affairs in America. But to procure that triumph, it was to his cousin Charles Carroll of Carrollton, who had been Jesuit educated, groomed, and peculiarly fitted to play a part in the American Revolution's political affairs. The broad and thorough educational training that Charles Carroll received both in France and England made him the most educated and cultured man in the colonies during the time of the American Revolution. In France, he had met many political dignitaries that, soon as, uh, that as soon as the rebellion began would be, such valuable assist, would be such valuable assistance to the American independence cause. One such man was the French Secretary of Foreign Affairs, the Count de Vergennes, in England, he learned English constitutional history and law, 
and attended frequently the sessions of Parliament and heard many of the debates on questions of American colonial policy. He made the acquaintance and was a guest at the house of Edmund Burke, a fellow Irishman and British statesman who so eloquently advocated independence for the American colonies. Once back in America, Charles Carroll immediately plunged into politics being elected to Maryland's conventions and committees, distinguishing himself by aggressively defending the American independence position taken by the colonies. Through his comprehensive education, tremendous wealth, he was known to be one of the wealthiest men in the colonies, and his ability as a debater and scholar, he exerted much power to sway opinions his way. He gained the reputation to be Maryland's quote-unquote first citizen and established himself, as one author described it, as a quote-unquote flaming patriot. Charles Carroll was a member of the Maryland Convention of 1775 when adopted the Association of Freemen of Maryland. The association was pledged to an armed resistance to Great Britain. We have already mentioned the Continental Congress appointment of Charles Carroll and his cousin John Carroll as a committee with Samuel Chase of Maryland and Benjamin Franklin to visit Canada to secure the alliance of the Canadians in the struggle for independence. The committee was clothed with almost absolute power over military affairs in that country. So I have to stop just right here for a second because there's something that you can easily read over and do not understand very well. When Carroll returned to the United States of America and became the first citizen, he established himself, as one author described it, as a quote-unquote flaming patriot. This patriot is something we should discuss a little bit. Because everybody who loves his country is seen as kind of a patriot, right? But the problem, if I want to call it like that, that we have with the wording here and calling uh, uh, Carroll a flaming patriot, Charles Carroll a flaming patriot, the problem that we have with this here is that you have to see that the only country or the only institution that Charles Carroll was a flaming patriot of was not the becoming United States of America, but the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits who educated him in Liège, in, uh, in Flanders, and in Paris, where he visited Jesuit schools. Is there anything you'd like to add to the patriot question, Walt? Yes, it is the key. It's the key they've used to blind the Americans. They've only given us history from 1776 on. This is the key motive for reading this book. It's the key motive is to uncover the fact that the United States of America was was Catholic from the very beginning. The, 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 the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, it was to separate us from pr Protestant England. And they used the Freemasons and freedom of religion to get their foot in the door. Now, it's taken them 200 years to completely destroy the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. They don't abide to the Constitution. And that is very, very evident. And patriotism, patriotism is a blind religion. And this is the why we're, we have went to the carols first because the Carrolls are the hidden founders of the American Revolution. They just hid, they've just been hidden in history. 
Nobody knows anything about the carols. Now, in some, some circles, trust me, in Washington, D.C., and at the professors at Georgetown University, they know who the carols were. But even the students that are in the halls today of Jesuit Georgetown University do not, they are getting an indoctrination just like anybody else that goes to that to a Jesuit university or a, or a college university, for, and for that matter, to a university, because the word university comes from Rome. And the reason, the reason why we, we, we mention the Jesuits continually, they control education. And when you control education, then you, can, you, you control the minds, and then you can manipulate the whole society. And the word Jesuit has been taken out of our, of, our, of our vocabulary. And there's hundreds of books that are written about, about global government. And I just experienced this this last week. And good, good researchers, I mean some good material, but the word Jesuit is not in their vocabulary. And you see Charles Carroll, Daniel Carroll, and John Carroll, they were all Jesuit trained, and it could be said they all three were Jesuits. So that's back to you, York. Yes, and um, coming once back to the word patriot, or even flaming patriot, as associated to Charles Carroll, I don't want to push that and say this is only the Americans. Everyone is patriot of their own country, whether you are German, you're French, you're Belgian, you're English, you're Indian, you're Chinese, you're Japanese, whatever. In every country, the patriot card is played by your government. And the people have to understand that the government itself is only patriotic to the Roman Catholic Church. They never are patriotic and they never even act patriotic for their country they will maybe sell it you that way but they never do because it's always the agenda of rome behind it that is the patriotic agenda political leaders all over the world follow so that means that we all are let's say taken on the wrong foot so when you are being called a patriot and you say, yes, I'm a patriot, then first think about what you mean by that and who are you associating with. Are you associating to your government because it tells you you're patriot? And who does your government be patriotic to? Rome or your actual country that you live in? But okay, I'm going to continue reading now. We are on page 98 of the document. Upon returning to Maryland after his trip to Canada, Charles Carroll was chagrined to find that the Tory fraction, or the Loyalists, had succeeded in having a resolution adopted that declared a, quote, reunion with Great Britain on constitutional principles would most effectually secure the rights and liberties and increase the strength and promote the happiness of the whole empire, unquote. Very, very important sentence to understand. Read that twice or even three times when you don't get it the first time. But that actually means that a reunion with Great Britain on constitutional principles would make the Great Britain or the British Empire, as we can say at that time, that was Protestant, that was a Protestant country at that time, that would promote the happiness of the whole empire. So a reunion with Great Britain was absolutely off the agenda of the people who wanted to found the United States of America at that time. Further, the resolution prohibited the Maryland delegates to the Continental Congress favoring any movement for independence. Charles Carroll, and with others who shared this view, set in motion the process to recall the instructions given to the delegates while he was away and reversed them, which in essence was Maryland's declaration of independence. This was the work of Charles Carroll, 
and as a reward, he was immediately elected a delegate from Maryland to the Continental Congress. On the fourth day of July, 1776, the Congress of United Colonies, meeting at Philadelphia, adopted the Declaration of Independence. Charles Carroll took his seat in Congress July 18th, and the day after, the Committee of Congress appointed him to a board of war that consisted of five other members. This board was entrusted with the executive duties of the military department. It was empowered to forward dispatches from Congress to the armies in the field and to the colonies to manage the raising, equipping, and dispatching of the armed forces and to have charge of all military provisions. It was the War Department of the new government. It was not until 2nd of August 1776 that the Declaration of Independence was signed and Charles Carroll of Carrollton was among the 56 signers. Who told you that in your history class in school? Charles Carroll's vigorous involvement supporting the revolution kept him an extremely busy man. He was forever on committees and back and forth to Maryland and the Continental Congress. There was a new Maryland constitution to be adopted, a committee of five, quote, to devise ways and means to promote the manufacture of Salpetra, unquote. There were constant communications and correspondences to the Commander-in-Chief George Washington to France and to Benjamin Franklin while he was an American envoy in France and numerous letters to others. He was on a committee that gave his support and aid to Robert Morris in organizing the Bank of North America that was to set the government on a sound financial basis. Carroll with other wealthy men, including Washington, sent ready cash to Morris to assure that the bank would be a success. Comment. I knew you were commenting. Yeah, please, Walt. Well, what's, what's interesting, I have tried to read as much as I could about Robert Morris, but you can't find an awful lot. He did come from England, you know, and, uh, and he is also... Uh, the apotheosis that's in the dome of the of the capital of Robert Morris is, is portrayed as the banker. And um, what's interesting too, and he mentioned uh, the manufacture of salt petra or petra, that's uh, gunpowder. You know, uh, Charles Carroll was in also heavily financed the American Revolution, and so did Daniel. Uh, So by saying, bringing this up, I just want to reemphasize, see, it is very important to understand the Roman influence of Rome on the Potomac. You know, I mean, and today, today it's the reason why reading this history today you can't question, you can look in the streets and realize that we have a Jesuit, Pope Francis, coming to speak. An Antichrist, a biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist to speak to a joint session of Congress right out in front of us, and they don't know what a Jesuit is because they, it's not in their vocabulary. So that's, uh, Charles Carroll was, was very instrumental, you know, and he was a neighbor. It'll go on to say he was a neighbor to George Washington. And you can go up to uh, my website. I have uh, the Dory Grow Manor, the Do- Dory Grow Manor, which was... Um, Charles Carroll's mansion, uh, he was the third gen- generation Carroll, Charles Carroll, third generation, and he's entombed there in, in, the, in, the, in the chapel that he built on one end of his, his uh, mansion. So anyway, I, uh, that's what I got to say. Yeah, 
very interesting point that you made on Pope Francis coming to speak on the joint session of Congress, the United States of America, this year, 2015, in September. Pope Francis is coming to Maryland. That is Maryland in a Protestant country. You should really start asking yourself some questions here and there. I'm going to continue now reading the last paragraph on page 99. It is known that George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and Arthur Lee all strongly favored sending Charles Carroll to France to open negotiations for a French alliance. Quote, I am the one man that must be kept entirely in the background. It must not be known to a single soul that I am personally active in this matter, unquote. Charles Carroll is quoted as saying. That is something else that uh, Walt already said, I think, in another uh, broadcast of these. The Carrolls managed to fly under the radar. And when I make a video of this uh, broadcast, I will put again this one very much saying photograph of Charles Carroll in this, uh, in this video, right where I speak here now, that says, you don't know me, Charles Carroll. It was the intention from the beginning that you do not know Charles, neither Daniel nor John Carroll, and know their role in founding the United States of America. Because if you knew, you would understand that your country was only Protestant on the outside and never on the inside. And this is what we are discussing with this whole Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy book. I hope you understand that right now. I continue reading now. Let or me do you want comment. to say something, Walt? Yeah, okay. Very, very well put. That was very well put. I just want to make a quick quote from a pap written by a Carol, and we're going to get to it later, but it's just a short paragraph to say exactly what you said. Now, this comes from a Catholic publication, a Catholic point of view. Quote, despite their speaking, speaking of the Carols, despite their enormous contributions to the American founding, the three carols somehow fell below the radar screen of a recognition as full-fledged founding fathers. Perhaps that was because they were Catholics, in parentheses, as I got 1% in the country, and a culture that for many years was overwhelmingly 99% Protestant. That was right in a Catholic publication. They flew under the radar. And we'll get to that point a little bit more in the, in the later on in this article. So go ahead. Your okay. Uh, continue reading. Without Carroll's aid, the alliance would not have been brought about. Charles Carroll was even seriously considered for the presidency after George Washington's first term, if Washington had not have consented to a second one. After the surrender at Yorktown, the French troops camped in Baltimore on the very ground now occupied by the Catholic Cathedral that John Carroll began to erect before his death and celebrated a solemn Mass of Thanksgiving. This Mass was now possible because of the freedom of religion granted to the Roman Catholic Church in the Constitution of the United States of America. And when the Treaty of Peace was finally signed at Paris in 1783, Congress was sitting temporarily at Annapolis, Maryland. General Washington came there to submit to Congress his resignation as Commander-in-Chief. But for the celebration to commemorate the peace and final victory, festivities were held at Carroll's Green on the Carroll Estate. These few examples show us clearly that there was another side to the American Revolution, a shadowy and quiet but definitely a strongly Roman Catholic influenced Carroll side. And history has purposely passed it over, while Protestants are into great a stupor to fathom it. Perhaps as the greatest consideration that could be given for the work of this book is that it might inspire someone else 
having facilities for a greater research than what, is, than what this author had to bring to light more valuable information on this vague subject. However, we have looked at Charles Carroll's role during the American Revolution, but it is Daniel Carroll's role that is surprising because he is the link that connects it all together. Okay. I have one little comment. I want to reemphasize what Carroll said at the beginning of this paragraph of the of the paragraph up in the next par- of the up above paragraph. He said, "I am the one man that must be kept entirely in the background. It must not be known to a single soul that I am personally active in this manner." He's telling you. That tells you why. That's why we haven't heard about the Carols. If if America knew their history, if the patriots of this country knew this history, they'd understand who is running their government. You see, the patriots of this country, the patriotic movement, do not know their enemy. They, their enemy, our country, is run by Rome. The enemy, the enemy is the Antichrist. The Antichrist that every one of the reformers to the, to the letter agreed on. It's the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. This is what's this why there's a judgment in this country. This country is under a strong delusion. When you read Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, the whole chapter is about the Antichrist. And you see, the reason why the patriots, the patriots don't have all their history, they don't know their enemy. And as Bill Clinton said, maybe you can help me with that quote. What did Bill Clinton say? Never under... Uh, Bill, Bill Clinton made a statement in the beginning of the book Rulers of Evil that as far as I remember goes, um, the biggest uh, mistake people do is to underestimate their enemy. And that's exactly... That's exactly what has happened to America. America has been deceived from, from, I mean, it wasn't so much at the beginning, the people in the streets knew that the people that were fostering this uh, uh, revolution were up to no good. And And there was a lot of debate for 13 years. And and now, now we just have to fast forward to 2015 and on September 23rd. We have the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist coming to speak to a joint session of Congress, and the House chaplain is also a Jesuit. Why? Because the word Jesuit is not in their vocabulary. And if it's not in their vocabulary, there's no way they can comprehend it. This is not an accident. The reason why we don't, th- we don't know this history is because it's by design. It's by design. And it's not only, the, it, it's, it's not only just the, the Protestants. It's not only just the Protestants. Those students at Georgetown University today and in 28 Jesuit universities across the United States, they're not getting an education. They're getting an indoctrination because they don't know. They're mind-controlled. It's called studio ratio. How do you pronounce that? Studio ratiorum. The point point that you are making here, Walt, about um, the education it's something that people do not understand because they do not think far enough. When you have control of the education, you have control of every ongoing generation. 
and you can teach one generation this paradigm and you can teach the next generation the opposite paradigm. You can control you both sides. You can, you control. can control both sides. Right. It's like Democrats and Republicans. It's like black and white. It's like good and evil. Hitler once said, and uh, don't quote me on this because it's not exactly his words, but uh, he said something like, give me, the, uh, give me the children of today and I will raise you a generation of soldiers. In that kind, he said that, you know. It's just because that when education is taken from the private sector or the home sector, and giving into the public sector, public education, then the government says what's being educated or not. We look at all the learning plans that people are following today. All these plans are made up by the federal government. And who does the federal government follow? Satan, in the person of the Pope, in the person of the Roman Catholic Church. So the point is, that when education is giving, given to the state voluntarily by the people because they don't understand the consequences, they have the possibility to shape each and every generation after their idol, the way they want them to do, they want them to have, whether peacefully, whether warfully, whether fearing God, whether absolutely rejecting God, and this is what's been done the last generations, not only in the United States of America. Don't get me wrong. This is everywhere. This is here in Europe everywhere. Even in, in, in Germany, you are not allowed to put a cross anymore in the, in, in the classroom, and certainly not today when you are uh, having the whole discussion about the Muslims and all that stuff. You know, taking God out of the equation. And that brings me to another very interesting quote that was also made somewhere in uh, Rulers of Evil that comes from Martin Luther. And I'm sorry, I really have to look this up here right now because you have to understand that goes together with the whole education uh, subject that we were just talking about. Uh, just can't find it anywhere. It was a quote that Martin Luther wrote in 1520. And it is cited in the book Rulers of Evil. Just I'm looking here for a second, but uh, I, I know uh, the one you're trying to go for. Yeah, I, I think I'm already a little bit too far. You know, I uh, I put all this quotes here in this little document, and then sometimes you have to go very far up, and then you have to go very far down again. Uh, here it is: Martin Luther, in his writing, appealed to the ruling classes in 1520. That was even a time, people, where there were no Protestants, because the word Protestant was formed at the Concil of Speyer in 1529. Martin Luther had just three years before nailed his 95 Theses to the church door at Wittenberg, and he wrote a, uh, uh, an essay or a little booklet or whatever. It's called Appeal to the Ruling Classes, and it reads, quote, Though our children live in the midst of a Christian world, they faint and perish in misery because they lack the gospel in which we should, tra uh, should, in we should, in which we should be trained and exercising them all the time. I advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign paramount. Schools will become wide open gates of hell if they do not diligently engrave the holy scriptures on young hearts. Every institution where men are not increasingly occupied with the word of God must become corrupt. This is a very profound quote from Martin Luther, made in 1520. We are almost 500 years. We are now 495 years on. Think about that. What has become of the schools today? Think of the uh, different massacres that have been going on, Columbine and all that stuff. This is only because God has been taken out of the equation. And I'm sorry for maybe ranting on, but I really need to make this point. Half a year ago, we made a broadcast together that was under the forum of nothing but the truth 
And the video that you can find there on my YouTube channel, Dracula 66, is called Nothing But The Truth, The Externalization of the Hierarchy. Those were three parts. And part two is the most important part of that. And that deals with so-called ten satanic commandments written by Alice Bailey from Lucis Trust and enforced through the United Nations later on as a global, universal, or you can also say Catholic agenda all over the world, which stated that they have to take God out of the education system. And what happened in 1963? In 1963, in the United States of America, the morning prayer was taken out of school. Now, is it a coincidence that in 1962, Vatican II started, and in 1963, the prayer was taken out of the schools? Do you believe in coincidences? No, because that was politics, and everything that happens in politics happens because it was planned that way. There are no coincidences with anything that happens in politics. And there's a very interesting comment right here about teaching common core in public schools. Very interesting point, and I also mentioned that in a few videos on the Nothing But The Truth I uploaded on my YouTube channel. So have a look into that. Common core is a very exact point of that. Also taking out God of the daily life of the children who visit school and are not being educated but being indoctrinated with the knowledge, quote-unquote, that Rome wants them to have, and not the knowledge the Bible should and could teach them. And Got any remarks here, Walt? Yes, and in 1963 also is when they fired off, it was, it was, it was, it was in Eisenhower's uh, before Eisenhower got out of office, but that's when they fired evolution and creation. That is one of the keys to breaking down the doors of, of, of faith. And now they're teaching evolution in, in colleges as fact. And the reason for this, real simply, the reason why that they pushed evolution over creation. If you can get young minds to believe in a Big Bang Theory, and I can't think of the Jesuit who started that. If you do, go ahead and give it to me. But it was a Jesuit who started the Big Bang Theory. But if you can get young people and the people in the world to believe that they're an accident, they, they, they crawled out of a swamp, you can become their gods. And that's exactly what they're doing. And we have a man that's possibly going to do life in prison because he was exposing this, and that's Kent Hoven. Yeah, they try to find more and more points to accuse him of things that he's never done just to keep him out of the universities and of the schools because they see what damage he has done, damage to their agenda by teaching children creation and thinking about that even um, evolution is a religion. And when the one religion, creation, is banned, one minute. And the other religion, um, evolution, is being taught. Well, doesn't it say in the Constitution of the United States of America that you have freedom of religion? Where is that freedom when it comes to the Bible? That is very hard to search these days. Daniel Carroll, the third of the Carrolls that we deal with now altogether, was born on July 22nd, 1730, and died age 66 on July 5th, 1796. So he um, was seven years into the new founded United States of America. Well, he did his job, so then he could go. Okay. He was 66 when he died in 1796. After the great work of separating themselves, 
and gaining independence from British rule was accomplished, it was now necessary to form a suitable government for the new nation that would provide its citizens the guarantee of civil and religious liberties, which had been the real purpose of the revolution from the start. The quote-unquote confederation of the United States had served its purpose during the war, but all agreed it had numerous shortcomings. So on May 25, 1787, the Federal Constitutional Convention was held at Independence Hall in Philadelphia to draft a new constitution with George Washington chosen to serve as its president. It was recorded, quote, this began the meeting of one of the greatest sessions of wise men in the history of the world, unquote. And two men, Thomas Fitzsimmons of Pennsylvania and Daniel Carroll of Maryland, were among those, quote-unquote, wise men, representing their Roman Catholic constitu constituencies. Sorry, sometimes I have trouble reading the one or the other word. Forgive me for that. Daniel Carroll, brother of Archbishop Carroll, uh, that must read uh, John Carroll, if I'm not mistaken. Huh? Daniel Carroll, brother of Archbishop John Carroll, was politically in the, uh, Charles Carroll, sorry, was politically in his time one of the most influential men of his native state, even though his illustrious brother and cousin Charles somewhat overshadowed his fame. Daniel Carroll had been a member of the Continental Congress of the Maryland Council and of the Maryland Senate, which at one time he was its president. As a member of the Continental Congress, he took an active part in the negotiations for the French alliance. After the Constitution of the United States had been framed, very interesting choice of word, the Constitution had been framed. Daniel Carroll returned to Maryland, where by his efforts, the American Constitution was adopted by that state. On September 17, 1787, the draft constitution was accepted, approved, and signed by 39 of 42 delegates present. Between December 7th and June 25th of the following year, even though there was much opposition and reluctance because the constitution failed to adopt a Bill of Rights, each of the states individually ratified it. Those who favored the incorporation in the Constitution of a Bill of Rights that would include a provision for religious liberty waited patiently for the opening of the first Congress, which would then present the opportunity of introducing the amendments which were favored. In the work of the amendment, the Carols of Maryland were to play an important role. On short com yes, a short, yes, short well. comment. Uh, <clears throat> see, see, there, there was a lot of debate, and you know, there's there's not a lot written, but the the people in the streets, there was a lot of people knew what these boys were up to, and so, and you know, the truth of it is, we would. It was the Bill of Rights that got everybody to, to agree to agree on becoming a nation and, 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 and signing the Constitution. It was the Bill of Rights because you know uh, you know like freedom of religion, we know where that led. But where in history has Rome ever believed in freedom of religion? Oh, Rome only believes in freedom of religion as long as they are not part of the religious uh, movement in that country. As soon as they gotten in and they took over, freedom of religion is far, far away. Because but let me tell you one other thing, Walt. In the Church of Jesus Christ, there is no freedom of religion either. Right. Because the first commandment reads, I am the Lord thy God, and you shall have no other gods before me. 
That is no freedom of religion, and I'm glad for that, but I'm not glad for the not having freedom of religion under the system of Antichrist, which is the Roman Catholic system. Let yeah. me make that very, very clear. The Antichrist only uses freedom of religion to get in to the door, and the moment they got in, and the moment they took over, they shut the door for every other religion. Except, of course, for those religions who have agreed to be working with her. Like, and that's what we have dealt with on the other broadcasts on Hour of the Truth, as you probably remember when we are dealing with the Catholic Lutheran Accord, that the Lutheran Worldwide Federation signed in 1999 to give up their protest. And of course, the Muslims will have no problem with that because the Muslims, Islam, is a religion that was founded by the Roman Catholic Church. They all have things they can agree on. And that is the one thing they differ from the true remnant church of Jesus Christ. That church, Jesus Christ, God himself, the true church, does not make any compromise. It is Jesus' way or it's the highway. But you are giving a free choice. And that is something that you do not have under the system of Antichrist. Because when you do not follow that Antichrist system, you are extirpated. You are being JFK'd, executed tortured you are whether living under the system or you're dead under the system and therefore i love the true church of jesus christ you don't want to follow him he has no problem with that but he tells you that you will suffer the consequences and you have the choice whether to join him or not to and that to me is freedom of religion, is freedom of conscience. What the one promises, the other gives freely. What the one persecutes you for, the other one gives you freely. Think about that. Something else, Walt, you wanted to say? Yes, one little comment. I can't, we can't, I'm not going to go in, in depth in this, but... In 1688, under James II, they tried to pass the Declaration of Indulgence, which was uh, in the provisions of freedom of religion for everybody in England. Well, that caused a, caused a, a revolution. It was called the Glorious Revolution. And, uh, and James II went to England uh, and, and went to France. But what I want to say shortly, it's in Button 32 of Grand Design Exposed. Tom Fress interviewed Chris Pinto who was back in December 8, oh, 2008, I think it was. But it's the best definition of what, how, what the comparison of what, when I say Declaration of Indulgence, of 1688 and the Declaration of Independence in 1776. In that little broadcast, Chris Pinto goes into on detail. But it briefly is this. What they were unable to do in 1688, they were successful with George Washington in 1776. Yeah, what were they not successful to do in 1933 in uh, Germany? They are probably successful doing in 2033 or if some years earlier in the United States of America. Huh? <laughs> That's right. Sometimes it takes them a century, but they are still always working on the same agenda. You can count yes, on yes, that. The, yes, the same people, the same organization that was behind the Third Reich, the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits are the same people that are behind the government of the United States.
Okay, I'm going to continue reading now on the second but last paragraph on page 101 of the document, if you want to follow. On April 6th, 1789, the session of the First Congress had a quorum in both houses to convene. George Washington was then anonymously elected first president of the United States under the new Constitution. His inauguration was on 30th of April. The oath was administered by Robert Livingston, Grand Master of New York's Grand Lodge. The marshal of the day was another Freemason, General Jacob Morton. Yet another Freemason, General Morgan Lewis, was Washington's escort. The Bible used for the oath was that of St. John's Lodge No. 1 of New York. Washington himself, at the time, was master of Alexandria Lodge No. 22 in Virginia. The new government of the United States of America came officially into existence. Just for anyone who is maybe not up to speed with uh, this Freemason that we were just talking about here, keep in mind, Freemasonry is the Protestant arm of the Jesuits. And the Grand Master of all Freemasonry, when you follow all the steps from the lowest up to the absolutely highest position in Freemasonry, leads to Papa Nero, the Black Pope, the General of the Society of Jesus. They are Luciferian. Not satanic. They are Luciferian. Freemasonry is a religion. It's a Luciferian religion. Very important to keep that in mind. And now ask yourself, your first president was sworn in by uh, swearing on a Bible from a grand lodge, from a grand master in there. Is that in the name of Jesus Christ or is that in the name of Lucifer? You try to answer that for yourself. I've answered that for myself a long time ago. Continue reading. Of the 39 men that officially brought the United States government into existence, there is quite an array of them that were Freemasons. Of them, 13, 13, names are definitely known to be Freemasons and more than that number discreetly have chosen to remain anonymous. But one name, surprisingly or perhaps even not so surprisingly stands out. In spite of and regardless of the Pope's anathemas and fearful excommunication that sends one to hell for being a Freemason we find Roman Catholic Jesuit educated Daniel Carroll's name among those who are the most prominent of Freemasons. How is it possible that Daniel Carroll, who represented the top echelons of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church in America, whose cousin Charles was the most vocal political spokesman for that church, and his brother John, a Jesuit who founded the new American Roman Catholic Church, can be a Freemason? The answer to that question solves a deeply hidden mystery. However, it was not until August that the matter of religious liberty was brought up for consideration. Charles and Daniel Carroll both were members of the new Congress. Charles Carroll was elected to the Senate and Daniel Carroll to the House. Wherever the contest was to be, whether in the Senate or the House, one of the two carrots was sure to be in the arena of action. The end result gave us the first amendment to the Constitution, which reads, quote, Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, unquote. This was a day of great glory for the carrots and the Roman Church, they represented. As another phase of the quote-unquote great work was accomplished, it firmly established by federal law quote-unquote liberty for the Church of Rome to function 
and flourish in English America. And that opened wide the door for good things yet to come. Well, good things, Walt, you should have put also in quotes. <laughs> because they're only good for the Antichrist and his agenda. In the letter written some years let, later... Let, let me comment. Oh, okay. How successful were they? In the, in, in the last sentence, and that opened wide the door for good things yet to come. How successful have they become? By 1850, they were already the majority and the religious, you might call, right. By 1850. Let's fast forward to 2015. We have 28 Jesuit universities, 244 colleges. We have 50 Jesuit high schools. They control the medical profession, the hospitals, and the ones that don't have their name on it are incorporated. You'll find, if you do the research, that they control all the hospitals. They control the medical profession. We have six out of the nine chief justices are Catholic and not one Protestant. And in the House chaplain of the of the the House chaplain of the House of Representatives, we have a Jesuit chaplain. And on September twenty third, twenty fifteen of this year, we have a Jesuit Pope Francis coming to speak to a joint session of Jesuits. That's how far we've come. See, it's time to, to you know, and I say this, I speak and speak out to the patriots not to scorn you or discourage you. But I can't quote you the, the verse in the Bible that says we'll be unable, unable to, to war against the beast. I, I see these. I see people trying to stand up. There are certain groups across the United States. That Pentagon is forty acres. It's five stories high. They control the military might of the United States, and you might have a gun, but can you make war with the beast? You have to ask you the question. And what is the answer? Our liberty is in Jesus Christ. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. We rest in Jesus Christ. There's only, only the, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Christ is going to take care of this problem. It will be dealt with. And we have to have the faith that was once given to our founders of Christianity, the apostles, Paul, John, all of them. We have to rest in Christ. So that's my comment. That's a very interesting comment that you gave there, Walt. No, also something very interesting in the paragraph that I just read is that Charles Carroll was elected to the Senate and Daniel Carroll was elected to the House. So there you have the insurance that always at least one of these brothers, these influential people of the Carroll family, had a say in whatever politics were pursued, either in the House or in the Senate. And this is a little bit... I mean, it's probably not right, but taking a little bit back into the Jesuit oath, you know, um, that uh, your brother who is uh, maybe openly opposed to you, you know, but secretly, uh, secretly working together, but openly, uh, uh, openly against you. So 
when one Charles brother says something in the one in the Senate, then the other Carol brother can say the other thing in the House. You know, they're yeah. always under 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 the radar. You you should never forget that they were at least sixteen years Jesuit educated. Sixteen years of spiritual exercises and spiritual formation that leaves your scars, you know. They are just cadavers. We had three Jesuit founders of America, and no one knows about it. At least three. Oh, yeah. I mean, and three. I mean, literally, you see, in other words, the, to bring up the carols, you understand, in this last, it'll be last four segments of our broadcast, is, you see, you know, to understand the American Revolution and not understand the, the carols, you can never see what happened in the American Revolution. People want to hide behind, or not, I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, George Washington, you know, George Washington, we know one thing. He was a Roman sympathizer. You see, over here in the colonies before 1776, every November 5th, they used to burn the Pope in effigy. But as soon, that's the first thing that George Washington did. He he got rid, he abolished, and thought, and I even have a quote, thought it was childish, child's play to burn the Pope in effigy. Well, it only takes one generation. Of course, now we're in 2015, and we have a Jesuit Pope coming to visit the joint session of Congress. So in other words, no, no longer can when we talk about this, you see. But one thing I want to instill is you, when you listen and you're over going through the Internet and YouTubes and, and different, you know, listen attentively. But it's amazing how they have taken the word Jesuit out of a vocabulary where nobody even talks about it. I mean, you know, and, and, and then when they do talk about it, they elevate, oh, oh, I, I, I've got a Jesuit education. I mean, they brag about their education. And back in 1776, prior to, you see, that when they were suppressed in 1773, the reason why they were suppressed from 1773 to 1814 is because they had to take, they had to have the, the people, there was people, a lot of people knew what these re revolutionaries were up to. They knew it. And they knew Jesuit history. And, and when I started waking up to this, if you don't know what the word, who the Jesuits are, you have no history. If you don't know who the Jesuits are, you don't know anything about the Counter-Reformation. And if you don't know anything about the Counter-Reformation, you don't know anything about the Reformation. And if you don't know anything about the Reformation, you don't know anything about Romanism. And Very all, good point, Walt. Very all, good the, point. all the events that we've seen, and I'm parroting from, I got this from Chris Pinto, all the events is, that, that we've seen since the Reformation is all Reformation counter-reformation and what they're doing on september 23rd 2015 they're celebrating you see there's we are reformers we'll always be reformers we're the reformers but the protest is over and the proof of that is is the, and, and you can you can take this to the bank and when he comes over and when he walks into the halls of Congress, they're going to give him a standing ovation. And I hope I, I hope I hope that I could be made a fool. And somebody st stands up with a big sign and go home, Antichrist, go home, Antichrist. But I don't think it's going to happen. So, but we know. And like Bill Clinton, you know, Christ, why wouldn't Christ teach us about our adversary, our greatest enemy? There isn't an organization in the world that's more 
anti-Christ. <laughs> there just isn't an organization that even can come a close second. It's kind of it's kind of um, it's kind of earth shaking sometimes when I think about what's happening here in 2015, and the fact that God has ripped the veil back, or and let me and let me see see this history because all it is is history. This is not Walt Stickle's opinion or or York Lisman's opinion. I mean, the last four broadcasts we've been talking about the carols and history. It's just history, the history that nobody nobody knows anything about the Charles. You know, and, and now that you know the people that are listening to this broadcast, have, uh, t- test it. It's, it's really interesting. It's really interesting. You know, go out about when you're out and about and somebody and just bring it up in a conversation. What, what You ever heard of Charles Carroll? <laughs> you know, and or you can even ask some, a lot of times the word Jesuit. They don't know, they don't know what the, what the, what the word Jesuit is. But that's why this little book, this little book has got some big pieces of the puzzle. And the reason why we're not reading it from the front to the back is we want to be real clear about who the Jesuits are before we go to the first chapter of Ronald Cook's book. Because the first chapter is called Jesuit History. And the second one is Jesuits Today. So that's what we're doing. We're laying a foundation. So that's all I got to say. There is really something to look out, folks, for the future broadcasts on Hour of the Truth, I can assure you. And everything that Walt just said only um, gives me more confirmation that my decision to go on and do a public reading on the book Rulers of Evil from F. Tapa Saucy is the right decision. Actually, I wanted to start today with the introduction, but I had to mow my, mow, uh, to mow my lawn here. And after that, it started to rain, so I was just done in time, luckily. And that took off the focus of doing the reading of the introduction. But I will do that the next coming days and probably be uploading the first part, the introduction of Rulers of Evil, next week on my YouTube channel, Jockler66. And when you know that book, when you read that book, and when you study that book, and not only the book, but also the documents used to make that book, then you will see that F. Tapa Saucy may here and there appear to be a very interesting person with a very interesting things to read, but where does he get his knowledge as well? Everything is documented from the book. I can tell you that. You can look that up for yourselves. And then you will see that what the Jesuits or the Society of Jesus appear outwardly is not what they are inwardly. You have, again, the same thing that you have always with secret societies or with almost every society today. You have the internal knowledge and you have the outside knowledge or you have the, um, what, what are these English terms, Walt, right now? I don't come to that. Um, the, um, oh, what, 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 what's it called? Um, uh, like, uh, uh, the esoteric? Yeah, the esoteric, thank you. The esoteric and the exoteric knowledge. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Uh, it was on the tip of my tongue, but it just couldn't come out. Well, that, that's the problem when you're not a na- native English speaker. Sometimes you just cannot find your words. The esoteric and the exoteric. The exoteric is what they want to be publicly known. And what do the Jesuits want to be publicly known? Oh, they are just a kind of monastery. They are, well, they are for, the, for the Roman Catholic Church, some kind of charity organizations. That's why they are doing an education, doing all that good stuff for the people. That is the exoteric knowledge. But you have to get to have the esoteric knowledge, know what they are all about. And when you want to do that, well, there is also um, in the past made a video under the name of Nothing But The Truth. 
about um, the Jesuit education, and I took that from a paper that I took from um, a Jesuit who was writing this paper here in Leuven, in Belgium, where I live. He came from a Roman Catholic uh, university here, and he wrote a paper about how Jesuits are educated through more than 20 years and read that and then you will get a glimpse of the inside and what you surely should do when you want to know anything about the jesuits is read numerous and they are found on the internet and i can give you links if you ask me for that so ask that in the chat box of uh, in the comment box of the video or ask that anywhere you want there are numerous links to be found on the internet on what the society of jesus really is one of the most important quotes, and I can try to look that up here when I'm just giving a little time to scroll down my document that I've mentioned here before. One of the very first and very important quotes that was made on the Jesuits and one of the most really uh, putting, it, putting it down to, to, to what it's all about was made by Napoleon. You know, Napoleon Bonaparte, the emperor of the French at that time, he said something that I'm still looking for here. He said that uh, he lived between 1769 and 1821, and you can find that on the website www.godlikeproductions, godlikeproductions, in one word, dot com. The quote from Napoleon Bonaparte, the Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is a general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power. Power in its most despotic exercise. Absolute power. Universal power. Power to control the world by the volition of one single man. Jesuitism is the most absolute of despotisms, and at the same time, the greatest and most enormous of abuses. End quote. Now, Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, was a Freemason, and he reigned at the time, keep that in mind, he reigned at the time when the Jesuits were banned. Because the Jesuits were banned by a papal bull in 1773 by, if I'm not mistaken, Pope Clement. Clement III, if I'm not mistaken. Don't quote me on that, but it was, I think, Pope Clement. Yes, in 1773 by a papal bull, and they were reinstated in 1814. And all that meantime, Napoleon Bonaparte ruled over Europe, a Freemason. And the Freemason is controlled, as I've told you earlier in this broadcast, by Papa Nero, the Black Pope. And who was the Black Pope at that time? Walt, you know his name, right? Uh, um, Lorenzo Ricci. L L Ricci, yes. Lorenzo Ricci, and Lorenzo Ricci was, and I think we will find that quote somewhere in Rulers of Evil, he was present in the time of the founding of the United States of America, even though it is officially stated that he died in 1775, which I do not believe for one second. He was there, and he, of course, was the one who was the superior of Napoleon because Napoleon was a Freemason. And he did, the bid, he did the bidding of him, even when he sent General Berthier in 1798 to arrest the Pope. That was Bible prophecy fulfilled, the end of the 1260 years reign of the Dark Ages of the Roman Catholic Church between 538 and 1798. But okay, before we go too far away, I just like to finish now the reading of this um, last few paragraphs on Daniel Carroll and then we will bring this broadcast to an end because we almost run out of time and then we will 
take the conclusion and putting it all together of the whole Carroll family, all the three, Charles, Daniel, and John, uh, we will take for another broadcast because then we have time to deal with that in one piece and that would better. I, I think, Walt, that is better than just to start this now for five minutes and then have to cut it. Yes, that sounds good. Okay. So, continue reading the last two paragraphs on page 102 in the PDF document, if you'd like to follow. In a letter written some years later to George Washington Custis, the son of George, Washington wife's, uh, George Washington's wife, Martha, that he adopted, Charles Carroll said, quote, when I signed the Declaration of Independence, I had in view not only our independence from England, but the toleration of all sects professing the Christian religion and communicating to them all full rights. Happily, this wise and salutary measure has taken place for eradicating religious feuds and persecutions and become a useful lesson to all governments. Reflecting, as you must, on the disabilities, I may truly say, on the proscription of the Roman Catholics in Maryland, you will not be surprised that I had much at heart this grand design founded on mutual charity, the basis of our holy religion, end quote. Taken from the National Gazette in Philadelphia, 26th of February, 1829. In 1827, in a letter to a Protestant minister, Charles Carroll wrote, quote, Your sentiments on religious liberty coincide with mine. To obtain religious as well as civil liberty, I entered zealously into the revolution, end quote. And this continues our introduction to the three hidden founding fathers called Charles, Daniel, and John Carroll. In a comment, and I will, leave, I will leave now a little comment to Walt before I will close down the program. Okay? Walt, please. Your thoughts on the last things I read, Charles. The last comment that Charles Charles Carroll said. He said, "When I signed the Declaration of Independence, I had in view not only our independence from England, but the toleration of all sects. The toleration of all sects. That's ecumenism. Professing the Christian religion and communicating to them all full rights. Happy." This wise and solitary, sol, 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 solitary measure has taken place for eradicating religious feuds and persecutions and become a useful lesson to all governments. Now, what I'm saying, the ecumenical movement started in 1776, on July 4th, 1776. Now it accelerated with Vatican II, no doubt. But ecumenism started with the Declaration of Independence. You're right. Vatican II was only to give an ultimatum yes. to the Protestants. That's the point that we have to think about. And with that, I also want to rely to a few broadcasts back when we are speaking about the Jubilee year that will be introduced by our beloved Antichrist, Pope Francis, on December 8, 2015, and will go until, if I remember correctly, to the 20th of November in 2016. This year of Jubilee is the last ultimatum the Roman Catholic Church sends out to all so-called Protestants to whether come back under the wing of Rome or face severe persecutions. All the signs of these persecutions are already now being seen in the United States of America. Think of Jade Helm, this exercise that is being carried out right now. Go and look it up on the internet for yourselves, and I advise you the website remnantofgod.org and check out the guillotines that have been brought to the United States of America. And they don't need that to chop off the heads of some, uh, some uh, I don't know, uh, some Remote. puppets or whatever, but yeah. they need that for real people. The 
Inquisition is coming to you. And it is told to you that the Inquisition is coming from all sides of the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, not in these words. But when you understand what they say, you know what you are going to face. Get ready. Time is running out. Yes. <clears throat> and before time runs out, we are here to educate you in a way that you have maybe never been educated before. And, and maybe I shouldn't say educate because we don't want to educate, but we just want to show you what on the one hand is said by so-called authorities and on the other hand is meant by them. And that you can have the chance to educate yourself for maybe the first time in your life after all this indoctrination from the state side, from the school system and from universities and from the television and from social media and from Hollywood and from newspapers and I don't know what else I can sum up here to make it clear to you. To get yourself educated in the true word of Jesus Christ is essential for your eternal life. And that's the only life that counts. Because the life that you have been given here on earth, this maybe it's 40, maybe it's 60, maybe it's 100 years, is only a test. If you are worth giving eternal life and live with our Holy Father forever in eternity under the reign of Jesus Christ. So I want to bring this broadcast now to an end. Thank you very much, Walt, for your contribution and, of course, working on that wonderful booklet, The Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy, that we are reading on today. And we will go next week into uh, the... Uh, conclusion of this subject and um, discover the whole of the whole carols in there on page 93. Until then, thank you for listening. God bless you. Bye-bye. <laughs>